Hello there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a video on refactoring unit tests to property-based tests in Python. And I'm going to be illustrating this with an example for some tests that I use to test drive an algorithm for calculating square roots. I'll just show you the algorithm here. Uh, this, this calculates it using an iterative method called the, um, the Babylonian method where we basically we take a guess by dividing the input number by two, and then we go around in a loop, essentially re-guessing and re-guessing until we converge on the square root and return that. So it's a pretty simple algorithm. And I've got six tests that I used to test drive that algorithm, starting with the simplest test case I could think of, which was the, the square root of zero, just return zero. And um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get more test cases for my square root algorithm. Let's imagine that this square root code is critical code for it's going to be it's going to be reused a lot or it's going to be used in a critical feature and it can't fail. And in those circumstances, just six examples maybe doesn't give me that warm, fuzzy feeling. This is what we would call load bearing code, code that is um, critical for whatever reason and therefore we need to test it far more exhaustively. Now, I could carry on typing more and more of these individual unit tests, but what if I wanted to do 100 tests? Um, well, then I'd have to type out 100 tests. That would take me a lot of time. And I think we can work smarter than that. So the first thing I'm going to do with these unit tests is I'm going to refactor one of them into a parameterized test so that we can reuse it for all six of these examples. So I'm going to be using a framework called parameterized, which works with a bunch of different Python unit testing um, frameworks like uh, PyTest and unit test. So let's, um, let's import that. Parameterized. There we go. Hopefully that will install that for me. Lovely. Okay, and now what I can do is I can just import that into, oops, did not mean to do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, adorn, we're going to decorate this first test with the parameterized attribute there. And I'm going to use expand, which means it's each test case is going to be represented as a tuple. And then it'll expand that tuple and map it onto parameters for our um, test here. So let's first of all introduce the parameters. So this is our expected result, our expected root. And this is our input number. So let's um, first of all introduce a parameter there. That's not very helpful. Let's try again, shall we? What's the shortcut for this? Extract. Uh, Control-Alt-P, there we go. P, there we go. Uh, just this one occurrence because they're both zero but they mean different things and let's call this uh, number and that's our input and what we're going to do is um, in a minute rather than just have the zero there as a default value we're actually going to supply it so here we've got the root this is what we're expecting to get as a result okay and what we're going to do is we're going to provide as a tuple the same information there. And when I run this, we should get it's exactly the same test as before. You see, and it's passing. Um, but now it's it's working as a parameterized test. And we don't need these default values anymore. Okay, so that's the first refactoring we do. We turn one of our tests into a parameterized tests, a test. Okay, and what we can do now is we can add as more tuples, more test cases. So one and one, square root of four is two, square root of nine, see how easy this is now, is three. So the exact same test cases, I'm not adding new tests, I'm just refactoring here, 16, 
square root of that is 4, and then finally our, our decimal at the end, the square root of 0 0.25 is 0 0.5. Okay, let's run all of those. Okay, and what we've got now is we've got a bunch of redundant tests that duplicate the test cases we added. There we go. Now just from doing it that way, so it's still the same test, all six test cases as before. <coughs> Excuse me. But just from doing it like this now, it's very, very easy. As you'll see, if I want to add more test cases, like the square root of 25 is 5, it's much easier now. So we've made life easier for ourselves, and we've also removed some duplication from our test code. These are all different examples of the same behavior, the same rule, if you like, um, and therefore um, they could be expressed as a parameterized test. There is one thing that's bugging me, though, which is this. is misleading now, so let's call that a test square root. Okay. So there we go. That's that's one win that we've had already, which is we've removed some duplicate test code, so there's a, there's less test code, and we've now made it much easier to add new test cases. We can just keep going with you know as many as we want. But even with this being so easy now to add t test cases, I'm not going to sit here and type out another however many another 94 cases. So what we want to be able to do and this is where the working smarter bit comes, is I'd like to be able to generate this array of test cases rather than just coding it by hand so that we can have arbitrarily as many as we like. For example, if we wanted to test a range from 0 to 99, um, we could... Let's just see if we can do this. So we could go something like, I don't know, map... And then um, we need our function, so let's create a lambda here. Um, and we've got our um, our number. Okay. And what we're saying is, is we'd like that number to be um, a tuple. So it's the number followed by a comma. So one test case for each in the following collection. And now we need to, let's do range of 100. So that will generate, I think, 0 to 99 maybe. Um, but there's a problem. This thing here. How will we know what the square root needs to be? And this is where our property-based test comes in. We actually only need the input parameter number if we change our assertion assert um, uh, less than So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to multiply. No, that's not what I mean at all. We'll just do, yeah, we can do a cert equal. That'll work. Don't know what I was thinking there. So what we're expecting is that our number will be equal to our square root squared. Does that make sense? So every number, if it really is the square root of the input number, if we were to square it, if we were to reverse the computation, we should end up back with the original number. This is a property of every square root. Every square root, if you square it, should be equal to the original input. So let's run that and find out what happens. And of course they all fail. Now here's the question. Why are they failing? Let's take a look. Now this is very interesting. They're very, very close, but not quite. Close but no cigar here. 
And we didn't spot that before when we were doing it with just those six examples because we've got lots more examples now. So we're getting some floating point kind of shenanigans going on here. And um, so, so what can we do about this? Well, I think that my squirrel algorithm is probably, because of floating point um, arithmetic, is probably only going to work to a certain number of decimal places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a variation on a cert equal where we're saying that should be true but to a certain number of places like I don't know 12 decimal places let's see if that's done right and there we are now they're passing so our square root algorithm is is, is accurate to 12 decimal places almost um, but that's as good as it's going to get probably for floating point. Um, so I'm happy with this. I'm happy with this rewritten property-based test. And this is what we mean by a property-based test. What we're saying is, we're not saying the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 16 is 4. What we're saying is, for any input, for any number that's a positive integer, from 0 up to whatever, or a positive floating point number, so from 0 to you know as high as they go, it should be true that if we were to square root that and then multiply the square root by itself, we should end up with the original input, and that's how we know that it's the square root. Simple as that. So that's a property-based test. We'll do one more example. So we've done a range from 0 to 99. Um, first of all, I just want to illustrate something. Let's say we wanted to add, we've got 100 test cases. How much code would I have to write to add another 900 test cases? Well, we saw how easy it was to add test cases with a parameterized test, but this is even easier. I am now going to add 900 test cases with one click of a button there, one character. So now we have 1,000 square roots from 0 to 999. There we go, pretty fast, 0.6 seconds. And what if we had to add another 9,000 test cases from 0 to 9,999? Taking a little longer, but still, ah. And now we're getting a bunch of failures. This is interesting. I'm willing to bet what's happened here is our floating point, let's take it down one notch, is starting to fail for those higher numbers. Yeah. So for numbers up to 10,000, it's accurate to 11 decimal places and so on and so forth. So we're discovering stuff that we wouldn't have spotted had we just stuck with those original six test cases that I test drove the design with. So we're discovering a lot here. Now let's just want do one more for our number there. Rather than having a number, let's just do um, random. A random number between 1 and 1,000 maybe, or 0 and 1,000. Let's just import that. So now it's for random numbers. And we'll just do it for 100. Off it goes. So there you go. 100 randomly generated numbers between 0 and 1,000. So those are property-based tests. They're very powerful things. You see how much test coverage we can get with surprisingly little test code, far less code than we had before. Um, so performance considerations aside, because when you do lots of test cases, obviously it takes a long time to run. If you're smart about it, you can get much better, much higher test assurance with relatively little test code. It just takes a little bit of ingenuity. And the key to that is being able to assert general properties of a correct result rather than saying the result should be exactly this. So theories instead of facts, if you like. We have a theory about a square root that if we multiply it by itself, it should equal the original input. And that's what property tests are all about. And what I want to make the final point about on this video is um, there is, as you've seen, there is a progression in terms of the workflow from unit testing and test-driven development to through, via parameterized tests to property-based tests, this very powerful way of testing, which means that if you're using 
um, unit testing and the way that we've been using it, um, then that that's a, there's a doorway there that you can open that once you step through it, enables you to buy yourself very high levels of test assurance. I would argue safety critical levels of test assurance without having to learn any new tools or, or, or without having to sort of sit down and learn a whole bunch of new techniques. This is stuff you have available to us. This is stuff that you're probably already using. We're just using it a little smarter. So there you go. That's how we, ref we refactor from unit tests to parameterized tests and then from parameterized tests to property-based tests in Python. I hope that's been of, uh, of some inspiration to you.